donor is, as you can see from my representation here, supposed to visualize that there is not, as it were, billions of recipients, but that the contribution goes to a representative recipient or family. I should say that I'm not in general a fan of the assumption of a representative agent. Uh, in macroeconomics and elsewhere, it seems to me uh, an insidious somewhat concept. But actually here, it seems to me it does capture quite well what I think many people have in mind. And indeed, of course, it's made concrete by many of the charitable organisations who actually seek to exactly establish that identification with that family, that group, the adoption of a family, adoption of a village, and so on. And so the way in which I want to think about giving to development is neither warm glow or public goods, but somewhere in between, where people, in fact, identify on a personal level, not necessarily literally, but metaphorically, with the citizens. <coughs> now, what are the implications of looking at it in this way? The first question we have to ask is, is this individual objective function welfare? Now, it could well be, it could well be, effectively, that in a Pugovian kind of way, we're not taking the sum of everyone's utility, we're taking the utility or welfare of a representative person, and in that sense, it would then be very much like standard welfare economics. We'd be returning effectively to the Edgeworth formulation. On the other hand, there may be good reasons to suppose that the function f, the additional function in the individual objective, is in fact non-welfareist. And revealed preference certainly suggests that donors are actually less concerned with achieved welfare and more with the resources to which a person has access. And the Millennium Development Goals, about which Francois will be talking more in a moment, are concerned with halving the number of people with income below one dollar a day with consumption below one dollar a day. An income or a consumption which may be associated with quite different levels of welfare depending on the circumstances of the individual or household. For example, it's independent of the number of hours required to work to achieve that income. It may be associated with very long hours or very unsatisfactory working conditions, but these are typically regarded as second round considerations and don't then come in. And, getting to my, the title of the session, it may of course be multidimensional. That is, the concerns that the individual can express may well be famine, may well be medical emergencies, they may be with education, they may essentially have a multidimensional scorecard. Of course, I want to make this point here before I get to the social decisions. Of course, for an individual, in explaining their giving, we can't have partial orderings. We have to actually have some way of weighting these different dimensions. The individual decides to give the money to Save the Children, or to give it to Water Aid, or to give it to. That is, or some combination. That is, Clearly, in this case, we have to have a decision rule, not just an incomplete ordering for the individual behavioural decision. Finally, I should note that, of course, this individual may have read the works of a Marcia Sen and be concerned with capabilities. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, how from this do we move to a social objective? A social objective which, as I sketch some of the reasons, we need it for the narrow reason of my particular case study of deciding, for example, how to treat individual giving, issues about, for example, tax relief or degree of subsidy or co-sponsorship that the government might provide to individual giving. I think it will be an increasing public policy issue in time to come. It will also be very relevant to issues about determining the levels of ODA and more generally in terms of that's the kinds of aspirations that we look to. And in forming this social welfare function, as I said earlier, we need to ask ourselves how, in fact, we combine the two elements representing the different 
ingredients in the individual's objective. Now, some people say, just you are. Why? In one case, it's fairly, I think, fairly straightforward. If the other term turned out to be not a positive but a negative set of feelings towards the rest of the population or towards people of the period, then I think we have little hesitation in saying we should not take that into account. This is something discussed many, many years ago by Sir Dennis Robertson, who dismissed this quite vigorously. He was concerned about the fact that the existence of envy might make it impossible to say social welfare had increased, even if everyone had more of everything. And he said, probably now in politically incorrect terms, he said, we should call in the Archbishop of Canterbury to smack people over the head if they're stupid enough to allow increased happiness to be eroded by the gnawings of the green-eyed monster of jealousy. That seems, I think, fairly reasonable. <laughs> to me. But there are also those who say we should ignore F if the feelings are positive. In his recent discussion of warm glow preferences for giving for public goods, Peter Diamond said, the fact that warm glow improves the description of individual behaviour does not necessarily imply that social welfare should be defined including warm glow. Now, in part, that's concerned with warm glow not being concerned with outcomes, and that's a perfectly reasonable point. But he also says, even in terms of outcomes, even if the objective is formulated not as simply the act of giving, but as a, in terms of the benefits to the recipients, he says that the inclusion of warm glow preferences calls for using resources to give people warm glows. Somehow this does not seem like a good use of resources. And he goes on to argue... The case of inclusion is effectively a kind of double counting. Now, in the present application, I don't think that argument applies. In the present application, there's no double counting because the recipients, by definition, are in a different country. And although I haven't said it, the social welfare function I'm talking about at this very moment, or not in two minutes' time, is a social welfare function for the members of a nation state. By definition, the only way in which the recipients of individual transfers of development can get into the social welfare function is through the function F. So it seems to me that certainly, in the case of giving for development, if not more generally, I don't think we can dismiss, when forming social judgments, the concerns expressed by individuals. And that has immediate implications. It has immediate implications that the social welfare function may then be non welfareist Because as I've argued just now, there's no reason to suppose individual donors are going to be welfareist in their evaluation of the outcome of the transfers they make. So it may well mean that in the simplest form, we would incorporate into an otherwise welfareist social welfare function say, a measure of the extent of the representative, say, poverty gap amongst recipients of transfers in this time. And, more fundamentally, of course, if we're adopting a non-welfareist position as individuals in deciding our transfers, if, for example, something I mentioned in passing, we were persuaded by a marcher saying that we should be concerned with capabilities. Is it then not a little odd, as it were, for us socially to be forming our judgments on a different basis? That is, if individuals, by review of preference, are effectively looking at the impact on the capabilities and functioning of individuals, shouldn't then the social judgment? not just of F, as it were, but also of the small U, reflect that point of view. And so, as I said at the beginning, this is in part a way to smuggle back radical change into welfare economics <coughs> by the back door. But of course, it is the back door, and you may object to a small amount of transfer 
small sums of money, £25 a year, changing the way in which we view the whole society. But it is, as I said at the beginning, one of the few ways in which we actually do form, provide information about how we view these issues. Now, my last five minutes, I'd like to devote to going beyond the national social wealth function to issues of global justice. When Amartya referred yesterday to Thomas Nagel and his discussion of the implications of the absence of a global government, I was reminded of, in fact, another paper that Amartya himself had written many years ago about control areas and spheres of control, in which he says the prerequisite of a theory of planning is an identification of the nature of the state and of the government. The reference to planning makes it clear this wasn't yesterday. Uh, the planner, to whom much of the planning theory is addressed, is part of a political machinery and is constrained by complex structure in which he has to operate. Both constrained, but also, of course, enabled. And that, in a sense, is a one way of putting the naval point that in the absence of the global government, the, clearly our ability, our capacity to carry out these changes is clearly very severely limited. Now, the issue... I want to briefly raise is, is this therefore something we simply, or well, not simply, but we incorporate as a constraint on social welfare maximizing choices or, or evaluations, that we say this is the best choice given the set of political constraints, or does it change the way in which we actually evaluate the form of the social welfare function? And I think one could argue for the latter. Going back for a moment to the individual, I suggested there that potential donors are seen as framing the issue in a way which somehow made sense of what they could realistically envisage, thinking about a representative recipient. And it seems not unreasonable that they would expect their government to do something of the same thing. That is, if you take the United Kingdom, we're clearly not infinitesimal in relation to the world's problems, but we're something like 7% of the population that belongs to the uh, OECD Development Assistance Committee. It wouldn't seem unreasonable, then, for a government not to go to the lengths of becoming globally cosmopolitan. That is, for a government not to extend its social welfare function to treat everyone in the world, as it were, as entering in, but to extend it in the same way that the individual was positive as doing, to thinking about its proportionate share, as it were, in the world problem. That is, to have a social welfare function which had, not a representative person, but a representative proportion of the people below the dollar or one dollar or two dollar a day poverty line for whom this country took responsibility. And interestingly, it struck me, it hadn't struck me before, that actually the population of the OECD development assistance countries is actually almost exactly equal to the number of people below the one dollar a day poverty line. So actually it's literally you know, one, two, three, and it's equally as well there. So in this way we arrive at a position between, to borrow Edgeworth's terms again, the frozen pole of national egoism and the tropical expanse of global cosmopolitanism. And a country doing this is stopping short of global cosmopolitanism <coughs> in distinct ways. It's stopping short because it's only considering the disadvantage. It's attaching a weight less than one in the Edgeworth fashion. And it's considering only its share of the total proportion of the population at risk. But it will still be a more generous and I think somewhat more understandable position than that of the frozen pole. So what I've tried to do is to raise some questions which I hope, first of all, for anyone who is in any doubt that welfare economics is in need of not just some oxygen, but actually the makeover, that there is serious issues that are raised by considering this particular subject of individuals giving for development, that they almost certainly are going to raise just reasons why the social welfare function should not be welfareist, 
to introduce the kind of concerns which we've already been discussing this morning, concerns which almost certainly will be multidimensional, that the individual concerns cannot be ignored when formulating the social welfare function, and that they may themselves provide valuable information about what form that social welfare function should take. And that finally, the concept of a representative recipient may have some parallel at the level of national social welfare, which certainly, for me at least, provides one way of resolving a problem that has worried me for many, many years about the fact that patently countries do not act as global cosmopolitans, nor indeed is it necessarily reasonable to expect them to do so, but that we, need, we do need some basis on which to form policy and to carry out the kind of evaluations which Ophi and many others in which will be engaged.